live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. This man you're watching right here is New York Jets running back Clark Gaines. The New York Jets were not exactly a good team back in the 1970s. They never made the postseason and never even had a winning record. But despite their ineptitude, and despite never really sniffing the postseason due to the stiff competition in the AFC East, there were some bright spots. Wesley Walker was quickly emerging and establishing himself as one of the best receivers in all of football. Pat Leahy was one of the better kickers in football, even being named the first team All-Pro during the 1978 season. And then, there was this man right here, Clark Gaines. And the craziest part about the success that Gaines had was that it was entirely by mistake. That's right. He carved a solid career out for himself where he was one of the best players on the Jets for a long period of time, and did so by a complete accident. He did something on a play that he was not supposed to do. It somehow worked, and it changed just about everything. And this is the story behind Clark Gaines and the greatest mistake in New York Jets history. Before I talk about the play in question, we need some context to understand who Clark Gaines is and how he even got to the NFL and onto the Jets to begin with. When Gaines, a Georgia man, first went to college, the NFL was the furthest thing from his radar. He didn't get any scholarships and couldn't get into a four-year school because of poor academics. So he had to start out at a two-year college, going to Lee's McRae College up in North Carolina. As Gaines said, I had to prove something to myself that I could learn to study. During the fall, he would play football. During the spring, when it was the offseason, he held down two jobs, working a day job in construction and a night job as a security guard. Gaines was going to do whatever it took to take the next step, turn his life around, and make a name for himself. Sure enough, after finishing up at a two-year college, he was able to stay in North Carolina and play in the ACC for Wake Forest. The Demon Deacons were not a good team by any stretch of the imagination. After the school made Chuck Mills their head coach in 1973, coaching him from Utah State, they had five consecutive seasons below 500. And in three of Mills' seasons in charge, including the 1974 season when Gaines first joined the team, they only had one win. Still, even though the team wasn't very good, Gaines looked pretty solid, especially during the final season in 1975. Apologies for not having any footage of Gaines in college, since footage of Wake Forest football during the mid-70s is either unavailable or is kept a secret and is used by the government as a form of torture. But Gaines ended his collegiate career by saving his best for last. As a senior, Gaines had 977 yards from scrimmage, which ranked 4th in the ACC, and had 929 yards rushing, which ranked 2nd in the ACC. However, when the 1976 NFL Draft rolled around, Gaines did not hear his name called. There were 487 names called during the process, but Gaines' name was not one of them. He wasn't too surprised by the news, as Wake Forest was not a good team and did not have a single player taken in that draft or the draft in 1975. However, he was still understandably disappointed. That's when the Dallas Cowboys called and offered him an opportunity to make the team as an undrafted free agent. Here's an opportunity to play for one of the greatest head coaches of all time in Tom Landry. An opportunity to play with a consistently dominant franchise that constantly plays late December and January football. And an opportunity to play with a reigning NFC champion and a team that had made the conference championship in five of the last six seasons. But as Gaines was about to sign on the dotted line, the New York Jets came calling. The problem with signing with the Cowboys as an undrafted free agent back then seems pretty obvious. Good luck making the roster. If Gaines was going to make it onto the team, he would have had to beat out some pretty stiff competition. You had Doug Dennison, Preston Pearson, Charlie Young, Scott Laidlaw, Robert Newhouse, and their second-round pick in the draft, Jim Jensen. Even if Gaines were to somehow make the roster against all odds, he was never going to get any playing time. As for the Jets, they were considerably thinner at the position, especially after John Riggins went to Washington after the 1975 season, where he would carve out a nice Hall of Fame career for himself, and after they lost somewhat of a team legend in Emerson Boozer. Gaines took less money and decided to play in New York, where he had a better chance of making the roster. However, since he was an undrafted free agent, it was still going to be an uphill climb to make it onto the team. Making the Cowboys roster was like climbing Mount Everest, but making the Jets, while not exactly like climbing Everest, was still like climbing a really big mountain, just not a mountain as big as Everest. And there were quite a few close calls in there. Gaines recalls how he almost got cut on five separate occasions during that preseason. One time, he was about to get cut, but stayed on because another running back got hurt, and the Jets couldn't afford to lose two running backs on the same day. Another time, he was about to get cut until a completely different position coach saved him and vouched for him. By the end of the 1976 preseason, Gaines had found himself on the Jets. That's the good news. 
The bad news was that he wasn't exactly playing a whole lot. Outside of special teams duty, he was not seeing the field at all. He had one carry in a 46-3 loss to the Denver Broncos in Week 2, then never touched the ball on offense from Weeks 3 through 5. Gaines rode the bench, with Steve Davis and Ed Marinero primarily getting the reps at the halfback position. Gaines was just another face on the team, and even though he survived the final cuts and was on the roster, was not even close to out of the woods. When you're an undrafted free agent, 99% of the time, even if you're on the team, you can't feel too secure in your first year. But something would happen during the sixth week of the season that would change his fate and change the direction of his entire career. And it happened by complete accident. October 18, 1976, we're at Schaefer Stadium for this nationally televised Monday Night Football game between two AFC East rivals, with the New York Jets traveling to Foxborough to take on the New England Patriots. For the Jets, even though we're only five weeks into the 14-game season, their season is all but over already. They're 1-4, sitting dead last in the division. They've only scored 43 points all season, which is the fewest of any team not named the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and their point differential of minus 88 is the worst of any non-Buccaneers team in the league. Being just marginally better than a historically bad expansion team is not exactly good company to find yourselves in, especially going into a game that the whole country would be watching. As for the Patriots, they're 3-2, and, and need this win to keep pace with the Houston Oilers and San Diego Chargers for the low wildcard spot in the postseason. Sure enough, on this Monday night in Massachusetts, ABC televised a beatdown. What we got was one of the most lopsided results in the history of the program. Everything that could go right for the Patriots on this day did. And likewise, everything that could go wrong for the Jets did. New England led 20-0 at halftime, and by the end of the third quarter, had already posted 41 points. In 1975, the Patriots didn't cross the 40-point mark in any game. And here they were, crossing it in just three quarters against the lowly Jets. In fact, the 41 points scored through three quarters was the most points they scored through three since October 22, 1961 against the Buffalo Bills. New England had 475 yards of total offense, sacked Jets quarterbacks four times, picked up an astonishingly high 29 first downs, and averaged over seven yards per carry. Anyway, you want to slice it, this was a massacre on the part of the Patriots. And to add insult to injury, quite literally in this case, Jets starting running back Ed Marinero got hurt. Marinero didn't do a whole lot in Minnesota. The second round pick played four years with the Vikings and only found the end zone 11 times, being a bit of a bust. But he looked like he was about to revive his career in New York. In week four against the San Francisco 49ers, he had 111 rushing yards and a touchdown, along with 61 receiving yards. He followed that up in a 17-14 victory against the Buffalo Bills with 119 rushing yards and a touchdown. Marinero had nearly 300 yards from scrimmage in his last two games, and was playing some of the best football of his career. And now, he was hurt, unable to perform. Seven players wound up getting carries for the Jets that day, as the team tried literally every possible solution to fill the void. Enter Clark Gaines, who was about to squander his opportunity, yet completely take advantage of the moment at the same time. In the third quarter, the Patriots were leading 27-0 and were firmly in control of the game. When the Jets got the ball back, the coaching staff was looking for Clark Gaines to play. Gaines was not expecting this whatsoever. As Gaines said, I was doing what I normally do during a game when I wasn't in on special teams. I was sampling the water to see which flavors taste the best. Then, Gaines heard the coach yelling to get in the game. Gaines was confused and asked, Me? To which the coach responded, You're the only Gaines on the team, aren't you? Get in there. Just like that, in front of a national television audience, Gaines was about to get some meaningful reps. The only problem? Yeah, he didn't know the playbook. When Gaines got in the huddle, Joe Namath asked Gaines if he knew the plays, to which Gaines responded, yes. Then Namath called out a play, and when Gaines left the huddle, he got a horrible realization that he had no idea what the play was. Apparently, the play was supposed to call for Gaines to make a block on the linebacker, but because Gaines didn't know that, he completely whiffed on the block and went out for a pass. Everything was completely out of sorts. Joe Namath, who had already taken a beating from New England's defensive line all day, was about to get rocked. Gaines whiffed on his assignment. He was already on thin ice due to his undrafted status, and now, combine that with a lack of preparation and knowing the playbook resulting in the most iconic player in franchise history getting a vicious shot taken to him? Kiss his NFL career, or at least any playing time for the foreseeable future, goodbye. Except, Namath threw the ball to Gaines, and Gaines caught it. Gaines, despite not even supposed to be a receiver on the play, and despite completely misunderstanding the play, was able to pick up the first down. And when the players got back to the huddle afterwards, Namath was impressed with what Gaines just did, saying, oh, we got a running back. 
We got a running back, gentlemen. As Gaines said in retrospect on Namath, he didn't know that it was an accident. And with Namath trusting Gaines, he looked his way later in the drive, resulting in a 12-yard touchdown, which was the first of Gaines' career. It was the only time the Jets found themselves on the scoreboard all day. But what should have been a play that got Gaines released from the team turned out to be one of the greatest, most beneficial mistakes in franchise history. After that display against the Patriots, Gaines got the bulk of the reps the following week against the Baltimore Colts, running for 102 yards. Then he had 119 yards against the Bills in Week 8, and 103 yards against the Buccaneers in Week 10. Even though he barely played over the first third of the season, Gaines still finished the year with over 1,100 yards from scrimmage on 4.6 yards per carry. He actually finished fourth in the league in yards per touch that season, and wound up being named the team's MVP. He followed that up in 1977 with another season of over 1,000 yards from scrimmage. Gaines was a dual threat who could run on you and catch on you. In his five seasons with New York, he recorded close to 4,000 yards from scrimmage, and was one of the lone bright spots on some lowly teams. Gaines would play two more seasons in the NFL with the Kansas City Chiefs before hanging it up after the 1982 season. For an undrafted free agent to have a seven-year career in the NFL, and to be one of the best in the sport for a brief moment in time, is incredibly impressive. And it's even more impressive when you consider the context of that Monday Night Mistake. If Gaines picks up the block and doesn't go out for the pass, who knows what Namath thinks of him, who knows what the coaching staff thinks of him, and who knows how many carries he gets from that point on. That one reception gave Namath and company faith in the rookie, even if it was by complete accident. And considering the aftermath of the play, and considering the successful career that Gaines had with the team, where he was a force to be reckoned with, this might just be the greatest and most beneficial mistake in the history of the New York Jets. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed out to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jaguar9, and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping on the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.